Why did the US lose the Battle of Sevo Island in August 1942, which is generally considered as one if not the worst defeat of the US Navy? The Battle of Sevo Island, Japanese called it the Battle of the Solomon Sea, was one of the worst defeats suffered by the US Navy. News of the scale of losses would not be released until October 1942. About 1,270 Allied sailors were killed in the attack or would later die from their wounds. The answer to the why will be answered by Trent Hone and Justin Pike. Yet before, let's look at the geography, basic context and balance of forces. The island was a small island of the Solomon Islands. Where on the 7th August 1942, the one day before the Battle of Sabo Island, US Marines were landed on the islands of Guaral Canal and Tulagi. This was Operation Watchtower. For that period of the war, Watchtower was a big invasion, involving the whole 1st Marine Division with 11,000 men, carried by a convoy of 19 transport ships, the Japanese, the small local garrison, and those high up the chain of command at Rabaul, Truck Truck and Tokyo were caught by surprise. Yet the Japanese assembled a force of destroyers and cruisers at Rabaul that moved southward to attack the invasion fleet. This would result at the battle near Sevo Island, just north of Guadalcanal. The balance of forces was as follows. The Imperial Japanese Navy consisted of five heavy cruisers, two light cruisers and one destroyer. Whereas the Allied forces consisted of six heavy cruisers and six destroyers from the US and Royal Australian Navy. As such, the Allied forces had a numerical advantage. Yet if one looks at the losses, it becomes rather apparent that something went terribly wrong. Japanese ships all managed to leave the area. Only two heavy cruisers and one light cruiser were damaged. Note that the next day one heavy cruiser was attacked by a submarine and lost, but this was another engagement. Meanwhile, the Allies lost four heavy cruisers, three were sunk and one had to be scuttled. Additionally, one heavy cruiser was damaged and two destroyers as well. So how did this happen? What went wrong? One of the most infamous engagements probably of the Pacific War, the, the Battle of Savo Island, uh, results in the sinking of four Allied cruisers. Sometimes this will be attributed just to, again, the, the US Navy was unprepared for night actions, and that is why they lost the battle. Um, do you think that's a, a, an, a, an oversimplification? Were there other factors that were more important uh, in this defeat? I, I do think that's um, an, an oversimplification, especially if we say, well, the United States Navy is unprepared for, for night combat. We, we just talked about the example of Balak Papan, which suggests that in some ways they, they were. And one of the things that I think is very interesting about Savo, which you know, has uh, spawned and, and deserves uh, books of its own, is uh, there's a lot uh, that you can get into in terms of what went wrong or, or, or what happened. Uh, one of the, I'll list a number of things that I think were extremely important. One was the faith placed in the radar picket destroyers, Blue and, and Ralph Talbot. Um, the screening disposition really relies on them being able to detect uh, any approaching Japanese surface forces with their radars, and it doesn't work. Right, they, uh, the, the, there's too much clutter uh, from uh, land masses and, and other backgrounds, or, or perhaps the operators were too fatigued, uh, but they don't detect the Japanese a- at all as they approach. So without that warning, there's no opportunity for the northern and southern um, Allied cruiser groups to form into a single cohesive formation before the Japanese a- arrive, which was the intention. Um, the dispositions are problematic. So you've got a northern force, a southern force. There's there's a western force that doesn't get involved in the battle, but the intent was to be able to bring them together. Um, but if they're surprised, there's there's no time. And also, one of the things that I think quite is quite interesting and, and informative. There was a lot of concern about Japanese submarines. I think you know with with good reason. Um, so if you look at the specific uh, formations that those cruiser groups are in and where the destroyers are arranged relative to them, they're primed to try to detect and then fight off uh, a night submarine attack. Uh, That doesn't happen. Uh, So they're not 
terribly well arranged or oriented to fight off the Japanese ships when they when they show up, the, the cruisers and, and the destroyers. And the commander of the Allied screen, uh, where Admiral Crutchley, isn't there. So there's an interesting uh, a, a thing that I would like to know more about sometime, and I've heard some people who are looking into this, so I hope, I hope they draw it out, is with Savo, you also have to get into different assumptions about how the Royal Navy is going to approach uh, tactics and how the U.S. Navy is, you know, because Crutchley has a background in the, in the Royal Navy, and his approach to assuming orders and instructions appears, from what I've been able to gather, different from how the United States Navy would approach it. So it's it's likely there's some uh, difference of opinion there that feeds into this. But uh, regardless, he is also absent. Uh, takes his cruiser Australia away from the screen so he can confer with uh, Turner to understand how best to uh, continue the offloading of the transports the next day. And uh, they're all tired as well. All the Allied commanders have been enduring air attacks for two days, um, lots of long watches. And, and I think many of them are assuming that this evening is a time when they'll have a little bit of downtime. Um, and they're not they're not ready when when the Japanese arrive. So uh, Vice Admiral Mikawa leads his ships into Savo Sound, and he achieves surprise, which in these night battles is uh, really uh, decisive. the The ranges are very short. the The weapons of the day are extremely lethal at these ranges, and if the Japanese cruisers have a chance to line up t- torpedo fire control solutions and gunnery fire control solutions before you ha- have a chance to know they're there. Um, that is pretty much it. Uh, so the Southern force is dispatched very quickly. And then the Northern force hesitates because they're not sure that the cruisers that are approaching them are actually the enemy. Um, and so they lose what little time they have to be more prepared, um, because of the disposition and they don't know that, uh, the Japanese are about to be upon them and that's it. Um, so a whole series of things saw this. Not not minor exactly, but a whole series of um, events fall together uh, to make it a crippling and, and crushing defeat. And and I think uh, Makawa deserves a lot of credit for being opportunistic and and taking advantage of of every uh, flaw that the Allies make leading up to and in that battle. Yeah, and just to I guess to we were not going to go battle by battle, so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll mention to drive home the surprise point. Uh, in particular, is that in the very next engagement, uh, the tables are turned as far as surprise is concerned, and the Americans achieve surprise and they end up winning. Um, now there's, you know, there's uh, nuance and, and um, subtlety to that, but ultimately the surprise is like a very significant factor. I mean, Admiral Goto, he's confused throughout the entire action. I mean, um, he just kept, I think it was, he kept calling people around him idiots because he, he pretty much even after he was mortally wounded and all that, he never fully understood, at least during the action from what we can piece together, that he was under attack by U.S. ships. He thought it was a horrible, friendly fire incident. So Aoba was getting pummeled by the U.S. Navy, and it was constantly sing- uh, signaling, I am Aoba, um, trying to get them to stop stop shooting at it. Um, so that, it, that kind of drives the point home that the surprise is so significant. I mean, it, it's significant in all sorts of... Uh, of circumstances, but definitely in these night engagements at very, very close ranges, when they're they're going to be confused at the best of times, um, it, it's it's it can be absolutely decisive. Yeah, that there's there's two points in there, and, and you 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 finish with the second one. I mean, surprise is absolutely de- decisive, but the confusion also, uh, and that recurs in these. And one of the frustrations that I've had sometimes in uh, going through or assessing accounts of of these. Uh, night battles is it's very easy, you know, 70 some years on uh, in the comfort of an office or living room to feel like the battles made a lot more sense and were a lot easier to understand than they actually were. Um, and if, if you go through the action reports, sometimes it, you, you get a strong sense, particularly when you try to compare two or three together of just how different it looked to different participants who were, you know, had different points of view. Uh, these were very confusing uh, battles and very fast paced. Note, this is part of a longer podcast that will be released in the upcoming weeks. A big thank you here to Trent Hone and Justin for doing this podcast. 
Thanks to Naval Institute Press for sending me a complimentary copy of Trent's book, Learning War. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.